1809. Imperial forces have trapped China's largest pirate fleet in a bay. The government has 95 ships, 1,200 cannons, 18,000 men, and four western vessels. But the pirates have something no number of ships will overcome. Zheng Yat So, leader of the Pirate Confederation. By the time this is over, she will dictate terms to them. Let's go back a couple years. Zheng I, the leader of the Pirate Confederation, is dead, swept overboard in a typhoon. The commanders of the six fleets gather to choose their new leader. And those are some big shoes to fill. Zheng had been a good commander. He'd been with the pirates in Vietnam, where they'd served as privateers in a war that had transformed them from amateur bandits to a crack mercenary navy. And when the Vietnamese dynasty fell and the pirates were driven back to China, it was Zheng who founded their confederation and made them the masters of the coast, from the Pearl River to the Gulf of Tonkin. What man could follow that? But when the fleet commanders open the floor, the first to speak is a woman. Six years prior, she had been just another prostitute in the floating brothels of Canton. But now they know her as Zheng Yat So, which translates to Zheng's wife. And she has a proposal. She will lead this confederation. After all, though Zheng had led the fleets, she managed the business operation. It was because of her that every salt merchant in Canton visited a pirate office to buy safe passage before setting sail. Because of her, they were rich, and every one of them knew that Zheng had made strategy with her at his elbow. The commanders exchanged looks. The idea isn't absurd. In Confucian China, women were barred from public life, but these men are all from poor floating villages along the coast. Things are different out there. If a fisherman dies, his widow takes over his boat. Why should this be any different? But Zheng already had an heir, his adopted son, Zheng Botsai. And though he was still young, the lad was a popular and daring captain, fearless in attack and blessed by the gods. His flagship was a floating pagoda filled with idols, priests, and oracles. Madame Zheng had news, though. Zheng Bo had agreed to serve her as commander of her confederation's red flag fleet. This tipped the scale. The fleet commanders named Zheng Yat So their leader. And to solidify her power, she entered another strategic alliance. Within weeks, she and her adopted son were lovers. Madame Zheng got to work. Her first act was to strengthen her authority with a new legal code. The massive confederation, now numbering 70,000 pirates and over 1,200 vessels, had become disorderly. The pirates needed to remember that they were one organization, under one leadership. From now on, anybody who disobeyed orders would be beheaded, and all stolen property would be brought to a common trust until it could be distributed fairly. If a crew made a score, they would hand it over to an accountant. The captors would receive a 20% cut, with the rest going to a confederation fund for provisions and repairs. The new code also prescribed death for raping a captive, stealing from common funds, or going ashore without leave. Next, Zheng Yat So turned her attention to her favorite subject, making the money. The Confederation already had a stranglehold on the salt trade, but it was time to expand. She extended their protection racket to all maritime traffic, including fishing junks and foreign opium ships. She also dispatched the fleet to systematically threaten villages. They had a choice, pay up or burn down. And her treasure warehouses began to fill. The government tried to stop her, but the Qing emperors had neglected maritime policy for decades, to the point that China didn't have a modern professional navy. The government fleet was just garrison troops loaded onto fishing and merchant junks, the same vessels the pirates used. Madame Zheng's fleet, on the other hand, was a crack ambush force, trained to hide until their prey drew close. Then the fleet would sweep out of hiding, war junks opening up with cannons as small sampan loaded with spearmen rushed into boarding range. These tactics sent fleet after fleet of government junks to the bottom. But in January of 1808, the pirates killed a provincial commander, and Peking couldn't ignore the problem anymore. The emperor dispatched a new official, Bai Ling, with orders to quell this coastal threat. And he arrived just in time. For months, Madame Zheng had been planning an audacious operation, a full-scale invasion of the Pearl River Delta, with its rich trading ports of Canton and Portuguese Macau. 
In July 1808, Zhang Bo baited Canton's defensive fleet into battle and annihilated it. Now the path to Canton lay open. For a full year, Madame Zhang sacked the Delta. Pirates extorted villages and slaughtered whoever resisted, dragging off women and children as captives. Each depredation was bloodier than the last. The Black Flag fleet killed 10,000 people in a single expedition. Soon, citizens of Canton could hear pirate cannons on a daily basis. But the campaign was taking a toll on Madame Sheng's fleet. Raids were getting more costly. Their opponent, Bai Ling, had sent soldiers to train the village militias. He'd also clamped down on their supply lines on shore, forcing them to live on caterpillars boiled with rice. And the military was getting tougher too. Then, a British ship appeared, alongside 60 brand new Chinese war junks. Bai Ling had stooped to recruiting foreign aid. Usually, Madame Zheng had no problem outmaneuvering Western ships, but in river fighting, there was no room to operate. Within a week, she'd been driven away from Canton. With her personal squadron heavily damaged, she left Zheng Po in charge and went back to her base at Lantau to make repairs. And that is where Bai Ling caught her. In November 1809, Madame Zheng looked out to see sails on the horizon four Portuguese ships. Her squadron had only a few vessels, largely boarding and scouting craft. Worse, most of her junks had beached for repair. She sent an order to every ship in the fleet. Send help. Three days later, Cheng Bo arrived with the Red Flag fleet. He brought bad news, though. The Black Flag fleet wasn't coming. And the enemy fleet had grown. 60 war junks, 35 fishing boats, and four western ships. The pirates only had seven junks, which they moored bow to stern, blocking the mouth of the bay. This was a trap. The government had wanted Zhang Bo here. By threatening Madame Zheng, they had forced the pirates to withdraw from Canton entirely and gather all in one place. The Imperial fleet began its first attack, circling in to fire, then retreating to reload. The barrage lasted two hours until finally, a pirate sampan got close enough to hurl torches onto a war junk, detonating its magazine and forcing the enemy to withdraw. For days, Cheng Po burned incense and prayed for a southerly wind. Twice, the pirates marshaled for a counterattack, and twice, the breeze turned against them. And then the fire ships came, 43 of them, two by two, each vessel loaded with straw and explosives. The pirates, all moored together, were an easy target. It was a night of fire and gunpowder. Crackling ships drifted into the fleet, throwing sparks as barrels of powder exploded. But Madame Zheng and her captains kept calm, methodically staving off each vessel and towing it safely ashore. And then, a miracle. The smoke changed direction. A southerly wind sprang up, driving the last two fire ships back into the Imperial fleet. Madame Zheng ordered the beached junks towed out and made ready for sail. The next morning, they slipped the blockade with a wind behind them, using older vessels to shield the fleet from gunfire. In nine days of siege, Madame Zheng had lost only 40 men and completed her repairs without losing a single junk. It was a stunning victory, but it exposed a fault line in the Confederation. The Black Fleet had taken a pardon and defected. Over the next few months, the Red Fleet would find itself simultaneously fighting Imperial forces, old allies, and Western ships. Madame Zheng realized that the Confederation had reached its zenith. From here, her power could only weaken. So she decided to take a pardon while she still had a strong negotiating position. She sent the government her terms. Her pirates would get full amnesty and keep their spoils. Her men would also have the option to join the army and receive funds to establish themselves. Finally, she and Zhang Bo, now married, would retain a squadron of junks for use in the salt trade. The government balked. No punishment for anyone? They refused to allow that, and talks began to break down. So Madame Sheng ordered one last sweeping pillaging expedition to teach them the wisdom of compromise. Then she landed at Canton and demanded to negotiate with Bai Ling in person. Her terms had not changed. Bai Ling caved on every point, but he refused to let the couple keep a personal squadron. How could he allow infamous pirates to maintain a fleet of ships? For days he negotiated, begged, and wheedled. But Madame Zheng just threatened to go back to sea, so he gave in. 
Two weeks later, the Red Flag Fleet surrendered at Macau. It consisted of 17,318 pirates, 226 junks, and 1,315 cannons. But the rot remained. Madame Sheng went straight, or at least as straight as an ex-pirate can go, running a gambling house in Canton. But the Emperor failed to see the warning sign her career represented. He continued to neglect maritime policy, and showed no interest in creating a more capable navy. But what the Emperor ignored, others saw with perfect clarity. As Zheng's life waned, the British stepped up to the fault line she had exposed. 29 years after her surrender, a mere handful of British ships brought China to its knees, and the Opium Wars began.